right. So let's go ahead and kind of get rolling here. Oops, let me minimize that. Okay. So this morning, we're going to talk about understanding some home features. So this will actually be a four-part series that we're going to be doing over the next four weeks. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about pools, waterfront features. Um, next week, I've got somebody that's coming on with me that's going to be talking about appliances and some of those features. Uh, we're also going to be talking about interior features, so types of floors, different things like that. And then the fourth week will be exterior features. Um, the difference in wood, flame, wood frame versus brick home or block home. We don't really have brick homes in Florida. Um, wood frame versus block homes, uh, stucco, different things like that. Just really kind of getting you guys to understand as you're taking new listings, we want to make sure that you guys really know how to market them and be able to understand some of the differences so that when you do have these homes, we'll be able to price them more effectively and be more competitive in our marketing. So let me switch views here. There we go. How do you better understand, let's see, are you gonna have handouts? Um, I don't have any handouts for these, but I will be sharing this video. So if you guys need anything in particular, I can get them to you. Um, how do you better understand the various features and functions of the home? So we're gonna have basically five main objectives. Objectives, goodness gracious, I can't talk this morning. Uh, we're gonna discuss the different types of pools and pool equipment. We're gonna understand the differences in value for different types of pools. We'll talk about the types of waterfront properties and how to classify them most effectively. We're gonna talk about seawalls, docks, and lift types. And then we're gonna talk about the best way to market those features in your MLS listing. So when we say how many types of pools are there, the, the quick answer is two, above ground pools and in ground pools, right? That's kind of what everybody thinks when you get to pools. But as we were really digging into this and as I've gone through the business, I've learned that there are a ton of different styles of pools and each of them kind of means something different. So on the above ground pools, they're typically gonna look just kind of like this. They're gonna be vinyl on the side. Uh, they probably have some sort of little uh, ladder or something for you to be able to climb into. But once you start getting to the in ground pools, there are three main types, but there's even more than that. We're gonna talk about kind of what those are and then how the different desirability or the values to a prospective buyer within those property or within those pool types rather. So for an above ground pool, some of the pros and cons. The pros, obviously they're gonna be less expensive. You could go to Walmart or Target or something like that and you could buy these pools for a few hundred dollars. Uh, they're very easy to set up. They don't have a lot of land prep. So you don't have to worry about digging a giant hole in your backyard. You don't have to worry about moving all this earth. Uh, basically, as long as it's mostly flat, you can just put this pool out there. Uh, and it can be drained and taken with the seller. So it's not a permanent fixture to the home. So when you guys are talking to somebody that says, oh, I have a pool and it's an above ground pool, you really wanna ask a couple more questions. Are you gonna take the pool with you? You know, is this something that's gonna stay? You don't necessarily wanna compare this to an in-ground pool. And again, we're gonna talk about why here in just a minute. Now, some of the cons, because these are vinyl walled, now these are much better than they used to be, but before it used to be that, you know, anybody who had a key in their pocket could puncture the side of a pool. They are much better than that now, but they still could be torn. Uh, as you can see here, it would require a deck to be constructed in order to be able to kind of sit around your pool. The pump is typically small. So if you guys can see right down here, this little gray cylinder, that's actually your pool pump for this entire pool. So they're very small and typically your pools tend to be about four feet deep or less and they have very little filtration or cleaner, if any. So they're great if you have somebody that's on a budget and they're like, hey, we you know, are sick of being in the house. We wanna just throw a pool in the backyard. This would be a good way to go. The flip side to that would be an in-ground pool. And we're gonna talk about the different kinds, but regardless of the type of pool, let's talk about some of the pros and cons. For the pros, they're going to have filtration. They're usually going to have kind of a deep end with a sun platform or something like that. They can be heated. 
That's the other thing with above ground pools is typically they're not heated. Um, the heaters for an above ground pool are kind of difficult and cumbersome to apply. They can be customized to fit the space. So let's say you've got a certain area in your backyard. You could go in and find a pool that would fill the space that you have. They can be customized and normally they have a deck around it, whether it's paver or concrete or something else. They almost always have some sort of sunning space around them. So in a buyer's eyes, that's obviously gonna make it more desirable. Some of the cons, obviously they're considerably more expensive. You're not gonna put an in-ground pool in the ground for three, four, 500 bucks, even $1,000. Uh, if damage or leaks occur, they can be very expensive to repair. So keep in mind that this is now a permanent fixture to the home. So if this pool starts leaking, there may be some pretty severe ramifications for it. It takes lots of land prep. So again, you're gonna have companies that come in with backhoes and things like that and start digging out a lot of dirt to be able to put these pools in place. And then once installed, it's very difficult to make changes to them. Now, when you start talking about in-ground pools, there are three main construction types. You have fiberglass pools, uh, vinyl liner pools, and concrete pools. Now, in this particular graph, green is better. So the fiberglass pools are gonna have the lower maintenance, they're gonna be easier to install, they're gonna have less chemicals, and we're gonna look at each of the three of these, so don't get too bogged down with it. Uh, but understand, down here at the bottom, the concrete is gonna give you the most customizable size and shape, but you're sacrificing the maintenance and then some of these other speed of installation and things like that. So with all of these pools, there's a give and take. And it's really important to understand kind of what these pools are and understanding how it would impact a future buyer. Now, the one thing I wanna talk about here is low initial cost. So the vinyl liner pools will be the cheapest to install, but again, they have a few trade-offs along the way as well. So let's start with fiberglass pools. Now this in Florida is something that we see fairly common. They're very low maintenance. They have a quick installation process. They're compatible with saltwater systems and they have a low cost of ownership. And we're gonna talk about the ownership costs here in a minute as well. Some of the cons is they're manufactured offsite. So this pool actually gets manufactured and they just dig out your land and drop the pool inside of it. They can be more expensive to install than the vinyl, vinyl lined pools. So it's that trade off, okay? With a concrete pool, it's fully customizable. It can be any shape, any size. They can come in here and make this fit in whatever space, whatever look, whatever aesthetic. It is purely customizable. They actually come in and frame off the area once they dig it and then pour the concrete right inside. Some of the cons, it's obviously gonna require more maintenance because as you guys know, concrete tends to be an absorbent material. So it's going to take more chemicals because those algae can actually get embedded into the concrete. The other important thing to understand with concrete pools is you cannot use a saltwater filtration system. And we're gonna dig in and talk about the filtration here in a little bit as well. But for a lot of people in Florida, they want saltwater pools. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, but with a concrete pool, it just isn't an option. It also is going to have the highest cost of ownership over a 10 year period with the longest install time. So your, co your pros are, it's customizable. You can get exactly what you want. You can make it look exactly the way you want, but it doesn't come without some cons. Now the vinyl line pools, these are kind of interesting because they come in, they basically set the shape and then put this vinyl over it. Now this vinyl can come in different colors, different textures, different sizes, things like that. So you can largely customize the shape that you want, similar to what you would do for a concrete pool, but you have this vinyl lining. The trade-off is the vinyl has to be replaced every five to nine years. The warranties typically have considerable fine print and they can still harbor algae growth. So understand, this is not the same vinyl as you would have on the exterior of an above ground pool. 
It's actually a liner that they can put in to give what is essentially a concrete pool the look that you want with this liner. But understand, if you guys are listing a pool that has a vinyl liner and it's 9, 10, 11 years old, the potential next buyer would be looking at having that as a replacement cost. So as we're taking these listings, just understand by knowing the different types of pools, we know what questions to ask, which is just gonna help set us up as that professional. So let's look at the 10 year cost. Now this is kind of a nationwide estimate. This is not Florida specific. So there are a few things in here that are going to be a little bit different. In a concrete pool, you're gonna have to acid wash that pool shell about every three to five years. So let's just assume that it's every five years, you're looking at about 450 bucks to have it acid washed twice in a 10 year period. So you're looking at about a thousand bucks there. The pool cleaning service, when it comes to concrete pools, you're gonna have a very, very hard time maintaining that pool yourself. Whereas with a fiberglass pool or a vinyl liner, you very easily could. So understand you're probably going to have to have a pool service to come in and maintain the pH and the chemistry and the chemicals in that pool. And then every 10 to 15 years, you're gonna have to replaster or retile that pool interior. So on concrete within the first 10 years, excuse me, you're looking at about another $10,000. The pool liner we talked about needs to be replaced every five to nine years. So on a 10 year, 10 year old pool, you're looking at about between four and $5,000 to replace that liner. When it comes to chemicals, your fiberglass pool is going to use the least amount of chemical because of the way the fiberglass sets up, it's non-porous, it's non-absorbent, so that it doesn't require as much chemical to get the algae out of the sides of it. With a vinyl liner, it's kind of in the middle. So they figure about 400 bucks, um, 400 bucks a year for chemicals. And then for a concrete pool, it's about 750 bucks a year. So it is a significant difference between the three. And then when it comes to electricity usage, so this is the other part of it. And this is where it varies a little bit, but most of your electricity usage is gonna come from the pump and also from your heaters. And we're gonna talk about heaters here in just a minute. So over a 10 year, period, your concrete pool is going to cost you almost 30 grand to maintain on top of the cost of putting that pool in. Whereas a fiberglass pool is going to have probably closer to 4,000 and vinyl will be somewhere closer to 12. Now, what does this mean for a buyer? In all likelihood, the buyer is not going to know any of this. Because honestly, before I really got in the business, I didn't know any of this. We've lived in houses that had pools and we were like, okay, you shock it, you, you know, do whatever. But I never really stopped to look at what does it cost to run a pool every year? So I thought this was pretty enlightening in terms of what it actually takes. Now, before we get into filtration, do you guys have any questions about the different types of pools or anything particular to those three aspects? I'll give it just a second here. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and keep moving. Now, there's two types of pool filtration. There is chlorine filtration and saltwater filtration. Here's what I need you guys to understand. Having a saltwater pool is not the same as going to the ocean. Um, it is very different. And Edwin said, can you use a fiberglass pool to line concrete? And you can't. Um, the fiber, fiberglass is something that actually gets manufactured off site. So what they would have to do is essentially get, if you already had a concrete pool, they would have to essentially fill the concrete in to make it the exact size, shape, and dimension of fiberglass, which would be extremely cost prohibitive. Uh, but that is a very good question. So talking about the filtration specifically, the saltwater filtration doesn't actually turn your pool into the ocean. So this is kind of a misconception. What it does is the salt water system actually turns that salt into micro doses of chlorine. And that chlorine is what is used to kill the algae or bacteria that's in your pool. 
both of them are going to result in killing off that algae and they're gonna go about it a little bit differently. So we'll start with salt water. You have a much lower concentration of chlorine in your pool. It's gonna be softer on your swimmer skin. It doesn't fade your bathing suits. You're gonna have much lower chemical costs, probably 70 to 100 bucks a year. Uh, the people that I know that have these saltwater filters are spending probably 50 bucks a year or more um, to be able to maintain it. And Nick says he has a saltwater concrete pool. So they mentioned that concrete pools are not saltwater. So everything that I read said that you could not put saltwater filtration on concrete pools. So there may be, it may be that they've done it. Um, but like I said, everything I read said that concrete pools were not supposed to have saltwater filtration. Um, okay, so some of the cons of saltwater, the more ex they are more expensive to install than a chlorine system. So putting saltwater filtration, now in Florida, when you look at the cost between the two, while saltwater is still more expensive, it does become much easier to mitigate that cost over the, the period of the life because we use our pools significantly much more than they do up north. You know, typically pool season up north is like late May to like late August, maybe September. Um, whereas in Florida, we use our pools almost year round. So they are more expensive to install. They do use more electricity. So about $40 a month more to use the saltwater filtration by nature of the way it works. And we're gonna talk about that. Repairs typically require a professional. So some of the chlorine filtration and the chlorine pumps have a lot of do-it-yourself type of fixes. Whereas these, because of the way they're built, typically require a professional to do a repair. And they may end up damaging the pool surface. And this is where it comes back to what we were talking about with the concrete pools. The salt water, from what I have read from everything, is the salt water actually deteriorates the surface of the concrete and makes it to where it actually damages the pool over time. Now, that's not to say they haven't found some way to do it, but everything that I read said that salt water filtration was not recommended or not widely used on concrete pools. So it may just be something to be aware of. Now on the chlorine pools, they're less expensive initially. They do use less electricity. Repairs can usually be done by the homeowner and they don't damage pool features. Some of the cons, the higher concentration of chlorine. So like we talked about the pros for salt water, they can bleach bathing suits. If my younger brother learned this when we were kids, um, back in the 90s when everybody was doing the blonde tips, he had just bleached his hair blonde, jumped in a chlorine pool and his hair was green. It happens, it happens all the time. With chlorine pools, it's just something to understand. Your skin may get drier or itchy as a result of the chlorine. Uh, the chemicals have to be added regularly. So there's a lot more maintenance and a lot more monitoring that comes into the chlorine filtration. You have to store that chlorine. So especially if you have kids or pets or things like that, it's something else that you need to keep into a locked container. It requires regular shocking, which renders your pool unusable for a period of time. And it does have more expensive maintenance. So again, I don't expect you guys to become pool experts, but I just want you to have kind of a high level overview of what comes into this. So in Florida, more and more, everybody is kind of transitioning to the saltwater pools. The buyers typically want saltwater pools because they're lower to maintain, they're better for your skin. They have a lot of pros, especially if you're going to use your pool a lot. So just understand the fact that it is a chlorine filter is not necessarily a deal breaker, but if I had a saltwater filter, it is definitely something that I'm going to use when I promote that property because it's something that's gonna be important to people who know what they want. Now, when it comes to heating your pool, and again, in Florida, this is not as big a deal, but there are still people that want their, heal, their pool heated because they wanna be able to use it almost year round. So you're gonna have three main pool heater types. Um, each come with their pros and cons, kind of like we've done with the others. We're gonna walk through and talk about those. Oh, well, we've got a question here. 
Okay, so Michelle Flood says she likes her pool at 90 degrees year round. So exactly, and my wife would probably tend to agree. Um, you know, in Florida, yeah, the Gulf of Mexico gets crazy warm in the summer. We're used to warm water. I grew up on the Atlantic side where, you know, you go to the beach and it's 75, 76 degrees pretty much year round. I went to the Gulf and thought, this is a bathtub, this is not an ocean. So again, as you have those buyers, it's all gonna be subjective. But as a result, we do see a high number of heaters on pools in Florida. Uh, the first type is the gas heater. If the home has natural gas already, the gas heater is definitely the preferable way to go. If the home does not have gas, then it becomes a little bit of a different discussion. But let's talk about how this gas heater works. And again, I'm not giving you guys a crash course on engineering. I just want you to have a kind of a basic high level understanding. So first the pool water gets sucks in. It runs through a combustion, combustion chamber where heat gets added and then the water pumps back into the pool. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Water comes in, it's in a tube, there's a combustion chamber, it gets heated up, it gets pumped back. A uses propane or natural gas to fuel that combustion. Pretty straightforward. When you look at the gas heaters, it's ideal when heating a pool for a short period of time. So again, up north, if we were talking about, you know, maybe you wanted to use your pool a week or two early before it got warm enough, this might be a good way to go. It's very cost efficient to run and it can maintain the pool pump regardless of the ambient temperature. Uh, and we're gonna talk about with some of the others, it's really largely dependent on the outside temperature to be able to heat that water. With this one, it requires a fuel source. So either, like I said, if you have a home that already has the supply line, then it's a pretty easy thing to do. Otherwise, you're talking about burying or having an above ground propane tank that has to be refilled in order to do this. It can be somewhat expensive to install and it can be inefficient to use for extended periods of time. So if you're just running gas, running gas, keeping the water hot all the time, it can start, I mean, when you talk about the cost of the propane or the natural gas, it may not be cost efficient versus some of the others, like a heat pump or an electric heater. Now, the heat pump is really kind of interesting. A fan sucks the warm air over the evaporator coil, which causes the refrigerant to heat up and turn into a gas. The warm refrigerant enters that compressor. It kind of comes in. Here's the thing. So I can go through this. It starts to talk a little bit like a chemistry lesson um, or a physics lesson, which I don't want to necessarily venture down that rabbit hole with you. Um, but understand, this is essentially the process. So we can talk through it, but basically, it sucks warm air in. So in Florida, this is really helpful because we have warm air most of the year. Sucks warm air in, it condenses it, it heats up the water, it pumps the cool air back out, and then it pumps the warm water back into your pool. It's a very simplified version of how this heat pump works. And like I said, in Florida, when you have warm air or you have a pool pump that is in mostly direct sunlight for a lot of the day, you're going to get warm enough air to create efficiency with this. So as a result, an electric heater is very energy efficient. It's less expensive to install than those gas or propane heaters. But the con is it relies on that warmer air for maximum efficiency. Now that's not to say that it can't actually do this with cool air because it still can. It's got some things in there to be able to do it, but it's gonna run a lot harder. So you're gonna lose some of that energy efficiency to run this style of pump in cold air. And understand that it doesn't actually generate heat, it simply transfers that heat into the water. So rather than waiting on the sun to directly heat up your pool, it kind of puts it into that compressor and heats it up more quickly. Now the third one that we see, and one that we're starting to see a lot more of, are solar heaters. Now if you guys drive through just about any neighborhood in Florida, you're gonna see those big black, they almost look like tarps on the side of people's roofs. They're actually solar heaters for pools. Um, and they are different than solar panels through like what you would use to actually do solar for your entire house. Um, they're specifically done just for the pool pump. 
And then Edwin asked the question, does it store heat throughout the day? So it doesn't store heat. It actually just transfers the heat in real time. So what happens is there's a thermostat. Let me come back in here. There's a thermostat in here that as the water comes in, it goes, oh, it's cooler than whatever we've set this temperature to be. So we now need to come in and heat the water until that temperature comes up. So it doesn't hold any heat throughout the day. It doesn't have like the ability to um, be able to just store that heat and use it later. It's all done kind of in real time. Now with these solar heaters, the water gets pumped up. So basically it comes from the pool, gets pumped up either onto the fence or in most cases on the roof where you're gonna have the most sunlight. The water gets pumped through these small tubes where it gets heated up and then gets returned to the pool. So they, most of them are gonna look something like this. Uh, the water comes in from the pool, comes up to the top, and then each of these little black areas are actually small tubes that collect the heat. And then as the water goes through, the water gets heated, and then it comes down here to the bottom and returns back to the pool. So for some of the pros, it's very cost efficient. You're using the power of the sun to heat up that water. You're not having to use a heat pump. You're not having to use natural gas. You're using the sun. Some of the cons, when it's first turned on, it takes a while to heat that entire volume of the pool. So this is not a system where you would just, oh, okay, my pool's at 75 and I want it at 90. So I'm just gonna turn on the heat pump and make it work. When you start using the system, especially if it's something that you don't leave on all the time, it can take a while to be able to get that entire volume pumped through and warmed up. So let's talk a little bit about the takeaways from this section, because I know I've thrown a bunch of science at you guys, but when you're talking about pools in a home, here's what I really want you to take away. Ask the age of the pool, and ask the last time it was serviced based on the type of the pool. So if the pool is, let's just say vinyl lined and it's 12 to 13 years old, understand that there's some maintenance items in there that are probably going to need to be budgeted for for your buyer. Ask what type of filtration it has. So is it salt water, is it chlorine? Is it heated? Because again, kind of to Michelle's point, People like heated pools. They like nice warm water and they want to be able to use their pool for as much of the year as possible. But the other question is, is any of the pool equipment leased? So I wanna stop here and talk about this for just a second. There are pool cleaning companies that will lease you the creepy crawly and some of these other things that are in there. This is actually something that I have encountered in deals in the past is that some of this pool equipment may be leased. So even though it is presumed, excuse me, it is presumed by the buyer to stay, they move in and then all of a sudden the pool company comes and the, the cleaner is gone. And they're like, well, wait, what are you talking about? And the pool company says, oh no, they were just leasing that equipment from us. Uh, if you want it, you've got to set up the service with us and we'll lease it to you as well or you've got to spend four or five, $600 to buy that equipment and have it yourself. So when I'm taking a listing from a pool home, one of the questions I always, always, always ask is, is any of that pool equipment leased? Because you guys need to understand, you may have a very frustrated buyer, especially if you're the seller's agent, you're gonna have an agent coming back to you and going, dude, what the heck? Like, why is this equipment not here? And then you have to explain, well, actually that pool equipment was leased. It wasn't my sellers to leave. So if we can avoid those conversations up front, we don't have any problems on the back end. So do you guys have any questions about any of that so far? We got some good questions. I'll pop that up and that way if you guys have any. Okay, so that's pools. There's, like I said, there's not a ton that I really want you guys to become pool experts, but I want you to really have that understanding of the different pool types, kind of some of the pros and cons that come with each one, the different filter types and what comes out of that, and then the different heat types 
Because again, if we're looking at this, there are a lot of good things here that we as listing agents and even as buyer's agents can now look for to really set our buyers and sellers up for success as they're moving forward. So let's talk about waterfront property now. Okay, so this is where I get so, so, so many questions, especially from newer agents who are trying to fill out a listing agreement for the first time, or maybe it's your first time listing waterfront or water, water adjacent properties, I guess I should say, uh, that really just don't understand some of these differences. So uh, that's a good question, Edwin. Edwin said, what is the perfect combination to yield the most value? So what I would tell you is any pool that has been recently resurfaced, or a vinyl pool that is in good repair, that's gonna have the best return on you because it's got the lowest maintenance costs and it's going to require the least amount of investment from the future buyer into that type of pool. But again, the trade-off is it only comes in certain sizes, certain shapes, so you're very limited by what you get with it. Um, but that would be just kind of something to keep in the back of your mind. That's a great question. So what is the difference between water view, water access, and water frontage? Okay, water view means I can see the water somewhere from my home, okay? Now, in theory, a water view property is a home that sits across the street from a body of water, but that can be seen from let's just say through the neighbor's yard, okay? That technically is a water view home. Now, where we really see this is in condos because you may have a partial water view or an obstructed water view, but you do technically still have a water view from wherever the property is located. So that's what water view is. Water access means from the ownership of my property, either directly or through community access points, I have the ability to access a body of water. Give you a perfect example, Gulf Harbors, okay? Most of the homes in Gulf Harbors sit on canals. There are properties in there that do not sit on canals, but if they join the Gulf Harbor Civic Association, they are granted access to two private boat docks. They also have a private beach for the residents of that community and their guests. So technically, all of the properties in Gulf Harbors do have water access, okay? Doesn't mean that every property sits directly on the water, but it means as part of that community, you do get access to a body of water. And then water frontage physically means my property sits against a body of water, okay? Do you guys have any questions about that? We're gonna dig in a little bit more, but. In the MLS, and I grabbed this straight from Stellar, this is what is in that MLS input form. And I would highly encourage you guys, if you're not, to use this form. Actually, I'm gonna back out here for just a second. I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about. Okay, um, I just had it pulled up here. No, doc. Uh, MFR. Okay, so MFR. Pull up. There we go. Okay, this one. This is the document that I'm talking about. So this is the MF MFR MLS listing data input form. So when you guys are putting this into the MLS, everything is gonna go through this document step by step, okay? This is the exact order that everything gets put in into the MLS. So where I grabbed this information was from water access, water view, water extras, and water frontage. And we're gonna talk about all of these things, but I want you guys to be able to understand where I'm getting this from. Slideshow. Okay. So in this waterfront property classification section, in water view, we have bay or harbor full view, bay or harbor partial view, 
bayou, bayou, which we don't have a lot of bayous in Florida, beach, canal, creek, gulf, ocean, partial or full, gulf, ocean to bay, intercoastal, pond, marina, lake in a chain of lakes, a single lake, a lagoon, estuary, or a river. So we're not going to dig into all of these, but just understand that for the most part, the seller is going to know what type of body of water they have access to. You can kind of look it up and see, is it a pond, is it a lake? And we're gonna talk about the differences. Uh, does it have beach? Is it canal? You know, those kinds of things. This is fairly straightforward. So I'm not gonna to spend too, too much time on it. Um, if you guys do specifically have questions, we can dig into that a little bit. So this is water view. The next one is water access. Water access, again, means what do I have access to? Do I have access to the bay, to brackish water, to a freshwater canal that links to a saltwater canal, to a lake, to a bayou, to a canal, to a chain of lakes? Access deeded beach. So that's something like what they have in Gulf Harbors is that as part of your association HOA membership, you get deeded access essentially to that beach through your, um, well, actually this is deeded, so I'm sorry. What you get is private access, not deeded access. There are some communities where all of them share a deeded access, where you technically own one square foot or whatever it is of that private beach. In some cases, especially in condos, you may have access to public beach. So the condos that are on Clearwater Beach, they don't all have private beaches, but they do have access to the public beach. So kind of understand what it is that you have and then you can choose accordingly. Now, when it gets to water frontage, so this is something we get questions about a lot. Bear with me just a second here. Okay. On the water frontage, there's not a great way to know exactly how much footage you have of waterfront unless you have access to the survey. Now, Google Maps and some of the others do a okay job of telling you how much footage you have up against the water. But what I would encourage you to do is go to the survey or go to the, um, the county maps and things like that, and they will tell you how much footage most of this property will have to your waterfront area. If you can find this out, absolutely include it because this is where it gets to be really valuable. Now, we've all seen those lots where they're, you know, this wide at the front and then when they get down to the water, they get really, really narrow. So you're only going to have maybe five foot of ownership in waterfront. Now, that's a very extreme example. They're not usually that bad. Um, but understand that it could be. So in doing so, put in here how much water frontage you really have. Because again, this is something that may be a very big buying tool or a, a reason for buying for a potential buyer. Now, let's talk for just a second about water extras. Okay, so water extras are the pieces that don't fit into the other three classifications. So your water access, your water view, your water frontage, okay? These are the extras. In the ownership of, or having waterfront property, you do have um, some different pieces that you may have. Uh, one of the things would be your seawall. So you do have a concrete or an other seawall. And if you were measuring waterfront property, then yes, you could measure the seawall uh, as part of, of what you're looking at. So that's a great question, Cindy. But some of the other extras, maybe you have a private boat ramp. Well, in the case of Gulf Harbors, they have two private boat ramps that with ownership or rather with membership into the HOA, you do get access to those two private boat ramps. Maybe your property has a boathouse, or maybe it's a, a pond or a lake that doesn't allow boats. So even though it is a waterfront property, they may not allow motorized boats. 
That's something that you would want to stipulate. Sailboat water. This is another really great example. Let's say that I'm looking for waterfront property, but I've got a 40 foot sailboat. Well, there aren't a ton of neighborhoods that are going to accommodate a 40 foot sailboat. So if I do have a property that I know would accommodate sailboat water, I want to make sure that I stipulate that. This is the other one, bridges. Do I have to cross any bridges to get out to the open water? Those are the kinds of things that will have an impact for the, uh, for the property, for the desirability of the property to somebody who maybe has a sailboat. That would be an example. If I have to go through bridges that don't lift, then I'm not getting my sailboat through it. And Edwin said, is there somewhere where we could find out the boat draft or how deep the canal is? Um, that is a great question. And I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. I know that um, Gulf Harbors, they actually got permission in the 60s to blast. So all of their canals were actually done with dynamite. So they are true deep water canals. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm certainly, I've got a friend at the property appraiser's office. Let me ask and see if I can find out for you guys, because that's a great question that I'm not honestly sure what the answer is. Um, Oh, Michelle said some of the bait stores might know as well. That's actually a really good suggestion. Um, reach out to some of the bait stores because they work in this area all the time. When it comes to docks, and we're going to talk about docks here in a little bit, but you can have composite docks, concrete docks, covered docks, open docks, first come, first serve dock slips. So it may be that the community has 20 boat slips and they're not deeded to any one particular person. So it would be a first come, first serve. That's something that a buyer would want to know. Do you have a slip that's deeded off site? So you see this a lot with community and townhomes where you own your condo over here, but you own dock slip number seven over there. Uh, if it is deeded, that's something that you want to be aware of. Is it on site or is it off site? Um, again, the different types of docks. Is there water supply without water supply? Is there electric? Do you have a lift? All of these different things just allow you to ask the right questions for us to be able to be that expert and be able to market that property effectively. Okay, so what is the difference between water frontage and water access? And we kind of talked about this. Can a property have more than one classification? So what do you guys think? Can a property have more than one classification? Does it have to be just water view or just waterfront or just water access or can it have multiple? Edwin says all three, multiple. That's exactly right. So you may have a property, and let's go back to Gulf Harbors just because it's a community that I know well. You might have a home on a canal, so you have direct waterfront, but as part of that HOA, you also get private access to, or access to their private beach. So now you have private beach access as well as water frontage. So it is very likely that a property can have multiple, uh, multiple, classifications, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Now, I'm going to throw something at you guys. What constitutes a pond? Is this a pond? This koi pond? Is this a pond? Or is this a pond? So Edwin says man-made. So what, a pond is man-made? Okay. Tiana says the first one. Okay. So this is something I actually learned as I was teach as I was building this class that I didn't actually know. What is the difference between a pond and a lake? The answer is in the depth, not in the size. Now I kind of thought like you guys, a pond was man-made, but it isn't necessarily man-made. Ponds, according to Nimnolit limnology, which is the study of bodies of water, are shallow enough 
where plants could be grown across the entire surface of the bottom of the pond. So this area where plants grow is known as the photic zone, meaning the sun's rays reach the bottom, okay? A lake, by contrast, has an aphotic zone, meaning there's an area deep enough that sunlight can't reach the bottom. So as a result, there are lakes that are actually less than one acre, but that are deep enough to be considered a lake. And there are ponds that cover huge different distances, but that are shallow enough to only be considered ponds. So for terms of practicality, I don't expect you guys to go to the middle of the pond and dive down to see how deep it is to determine whether it's actually a pond or actually a lake. But understand that technically there is a difference between a pond and a lake and the difference is how deep it is, not how big it is. So this was really interesting because again, you see a very small body of water. Oh, that must be a pond. But in reality, it might actually be a lake. So there's a little bit of science for you guys, something interesting to learn. So when you have a property that is waterfront and also has boat access, we need to go a step further, but hold on. Before I get into this, I wanna stop because um, I was being a little bit facetious here, but I wanna make sure you guys understand. Having a koi pond in the backyard is not pond access so or waterfront. This is something that somebody just put in as a feature in their backyard and I would mention that there is a koi pond or a fish pond or a turtle pond or whatever that is, but this is not what I would actually consider a pond water frontage, water access. This is something that you could go to Home Depot, buy a you know, $40 little pond liner and you could make in your backyard. So I would mention it as part of my marketing, but understand this is not, for the purposes of the MLS, this is not actually a pond. This is a water feature or something that you put in the backyard. But technically, for the purposes of MLS, this would not be a pond. So I just wanted to put that in there. All right, so we have a waterfront property and we have a boat dock or we have boat access. Let's take this a step further and talk about some of the lot specific features. Now these only apply to waterfront properties, okay? So this would be your docks, your lifts, and your seawalls. Excuse me. All right. Now again, I'm not gonna turn this into a whole physics lesson, but I want you guys to be able to understand there are two main types of docks. There are permanent docks and there are removable docks. Permanent docks are typically going to be crib or suspension docks. And removable docks could be floating, they could be piled, they could be piped, they could be a number of other different things. But we really want to be able to, to understand what is the difference between a permanent dock and a removable dock. Each can be made from a variety of materials, wood, aluminum, plastic, fiberglass. You know, We don't see as many fiberglass docks anymore, but we used to. Um, and then the type that you would use would be determined by your desired usage, okay? And we're gonna dig into this a little bit more. So <clears throat> these are piling docks, this one and this one. They have pilings that actually go into the bed of the water and usually are cemented, okay? So this would be more of a permanent dock. This, by contrast, is a floating dock. So this floating dock, you'll see it can come, it's a little bit more free form. It can kind of fit to accommodate what you're looking for. This is also a floating dock. So it has pilings only in certain areas of reinforcement, but for the most part, the entire dock can float, it can adjust, it can shift. Sometimes they can be plastic. So this ramp essentially is connected to the side but this dock is just tethered to this ramp and is actually free floating. It's not anchored to the riverbed or the, the ocean bed. It is a floating dock, okay? And then same thing with this. This is actually an aluminum dock. Now, you have some really cool kind of hybrid docks where this dock actually has a swimming pool in it. I have personally never seen this, but I thought the picture was kind of cool, so. Sure, we can have all kinds of docks, even ones with swimming pools. 
because, you know, if you can, why not? Now, the MLS doesn't ask what type of dock the property has, but a potential buyer may still want to know. So it's important for us to understand, is it a permanent dock? Is it a floating dock? Is it wood? Is it aluminum? Is it plastic? What is the dock type? Because again, that may impact a buyer's desirability for it. If you have a wood dock that is 30 years old and has never been maintained, has giant holes in it, this could potentially be a health risk for a buyer, especially if they have kids or pets or anything like that. So ask these questions or go take a look at it for yourself when you're taking these types of listings. Also, different types of docks allow for different sizes, but different size of boats. If I had a 40 foot boat, I'm gonna need a very specific type of dock that would accommodate a 40 foot boat. It may even be certain types of property that would accommodate certain types of boats or certain sizes of boats. So make sure to ask the right question. When you're taking a listing, okay, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, how big of a boat would this dock or this you know, property accommodate? Does the homeowners association limit the size of boat or type of boat that could be present in this property? Because sometimes even those HOAs may have limitations to it. So make sure that you ask those questions. The MLS doesn't specifically ask, but it is important for us to know. Do we have any questions about docks before we move on to the boat lists? Again, I don't need you guys to become experts on all of this, but at least having a good baseline, a good understanding of the different types will help you as you're marketing these properties. And it will also create a way to make you look like the expert. Now, Olive asked, does the wood dock versus a composite dock affect the value? The short answer is no. Um, a 25 foot dock in wood that has been well maintained versus a 25 foot aluminum or composite dock, they're gonna have a different cost to put in, but in terms of appraisal or in terms of um, perceived value, there's not gonna be a, a huge difference there. Um, the big trade-off is aluminum and composite docks are going to last longer with lower maintenance than a wood dock. So that's gonna be kind of the, the trade-off to it. It kind of goes back to the types of pools, the amount of maintenance, how often you're gonna have to stain it, how often you're gonna have to change out pieces. You know, all of those things will come into play when you determine what type of dock is in there. That's a good question. All right, so let's talk for a second about boat lifts. So boat lifts are another piece of the dock, basically. Now, when it talks about the dock, one of the things it mentioned was a covered dock. And this picture on the right is an example of a covered dock. So you have a wood dock in here, but it is covered and it may have electricity. It looks like there's a boat over, I mean, a light over here. So it has electricity that's run out to it. It may have uh, running water to be able to flush out the motors when you bring it in. All of those things are questions that we would want to ask when we're talking about some of the features and functions that our dock may have. Now, there's multiple kinds of lifts. You have these kind of plastic composite kind of lifts that you just drive the boat right up onto. You have these metal mechanical lifts that actually have lift motors here that actually fully lift that boat up out of the water. And then sometimes you have things like this where it's specifically set up for a pontoon boat rather than a V-hulled boat. If I have a pontoon boat, but I have this style of lift, this lift is not gonna do me any good. I'm gonna have to change it out to accommodate the type or size or style of boat that I have. So again, for the purposes of the MLS, this isn't necessarily something you would have to know to put in a listing, but it is something that would help you when you're marketing this property to be able to get the right buyers in there and to have the answers to the right questions. Uh, Edwin said, covered docks in Florida are not allowed. From what I have heard, it is still county specific. 
So I'm not aware of any Florida ordinance that said covered docks are not allowed at all. Um, I know that there are still properties being built uh, up like near Wikiwachi, Crystal River, things like that, where you can actually have kind of a boat garage. So as you come in the canal, you actually lift your garage door, you pull it in, the garage door closes, you can lift your boat up out of the water. That technically is still a covered dock. So I'm not aware of any legislature that, or legislation rather that's been passed that said that covered docks are not allowed. But I know that there are counties that are no longer allowing it and things like that. So you would wanna go in and check, but there are also a lot of properties that have um, grandfathers and Cindy just beat me to it. Cindy said they can be grandfathered in and that's exactly right. There are properties out there that have docks, covered docks, things like that, that would be grandfathered in, even in the event that the rules have changed since then. So you may not be able to build a new style of covering, but if the covering is there, you can upkeep it, maintain it, make small changes, those kinds of things. Um, but the biggest thing in a boat lift is to also understand that they have capacities as well. Um, and Edwin said, just in case an owner wants to add it, then at that point, you would want to check with the county, uh, the, probably the county permitting office, and see what the rules are for that specific county and that specific neighborhood in the event you had a buyer that wanted to do a covered dock. But when it comes to boat lifts, they can range from 4,500 pounds to 200,000 pounds. If I have, let's just go back to a 30 or 40 foot boat, and I have a 4,000 pound lift, it's not gonna cut it, right? This is not gonna work for me. So I'm going to have to either beef up my lift or understand that this property might not be the right fit for what I'm trying to do. The size of the boat lift, or you need to understand that the size that the boat lift will accommodate. So even if it's a 100,000 pound lift, but it's limited to a 20 foot boat, and in reality, those two things would never happen that way. But if I've got a lift that would accommodate a 20 foot boat and I've got a 25 or 30 foot boat, that lift is not gonna do me any good even if it has the capacity to lift the weight of my boat. So just these are things to be aware of. And more often than not, the seller is gonna be able to tell you, hey, I've got a 10,000 pound lift, a 20,000 pound lift, a 25 to 30 foot boat lift. Those kinds of things are things that really your seller would know. And I can tell you, as I've represented buyers that have been looking at these things, this is the first question that I go to the seller's agent and say, hey, I don't see it anywhere. What's the capacity to lift and what's the size boat that it would accommodate? What I'm trying to get you guys to do is be able to know the answers to these questions up front so that you can be the expert as you're going through these. And Edwin said, is there a specific place on the lift that can tell us the capacity? Sometimes they have stickers um, on, for example, using this, there's usually a sticker and I think it's probably either in here or on the inside that would tell you the capacity of that lift. Um, if not, it would tell you a model number and the model number could be kind of worked backwards to be able to tell what the, the capacity of that lift is but most of them do have some sort of sticker that has that information on it. Now, the other thing you wanna know about a boat lift is what type of boat it's designed for. A V-hull, a pontoon, a deck boat, jet skis, things like that. Again, the more information you can have about this, the more of an expert you guys are going to look and the easier it will be for you guys to be able to land some of these waterfront listings because let's face it, a lot of these agents that are taking these listings have absolutely no idea. You call them and ask the question and they're like, uh, let me find out and get back to you. When we're taking these types of listings, when we're working with water view or waterfront properties, knowing the questions to ask will absolutely allow you guys to be set up as the expert. And that's really what I want you to be able to take away from this series of course, series of courses. Um, is that you guys will have at least a baseline understanding of what these features and functions are, what the desirability is, and allow you guys to really be able to get more listings out of it.
Now, the lift may be limited by the dock type. So if you've got a floating dock, you may not be able to put a 100,000 pound lift on a floating dock because it won't be able to support the weight. So these are other things that may come into account. Understanding your dock type may understand that there's a limit to the type and style and weight of boat that could be accommodated there. And if it's covered versus opened. So again, if I've got a covered dock and my boat, when I lift it out of the water is 11, 12 feet tall, and I've got a roof that's 10 feet off the deck of the dock, that may not work. We're gonna have a problem. So understanding that your lift type may be limited by your dock type. Now, before we move on from docks, do you guys have, or lifts and docks and things like that, do you guys have any other questions? Um, Michelle asked, are lifts considered fixtures? So yes, a lift is going to be a permanent fixture of the property. It is not presumed to be something that the seller would take with them because it has to be mounted to the dock itself. So it has these pilings, it has all of this. So in this case, yes, it would absolutely be considered a fixture of that property. And that's a very good question. Does anybody else have any questions before we move on to seawalls? All right, seawalls. Now this is where it gets to be a little bit fun, okay? A seawall is defined as a structure that separates land and water areas. It's designed to prevent coastal erosion and other damage due to wave action and storm surge, such as flooding, okay? Now, seawalls are normally massive structures because they're designed to resist the full wave or the full force of waves and storm surge. There's two main types of seawalls. We have vertical walls, like this one on the left, and then we have what are called rip wrap embankments. Now, in Tarpon Springs, we see these a lot, much more than this style of seawall. Understand that both of these things are technically considered a seawall. Now, if I walked by and saw a bunch of rocks along the edge of the water, my mind would not immediately go to, oh, that's a seawall. But for the purposes of classification, technically it is. So just kind of understand that. When we get into the option of seawalls, we only have two choices, seawall concrete or seawall other. So understand that this is seawall concrete, this is seawall other. That's pretty much the only two choices we get. You want to be able to identify whether the property has one and what type it is. Okay. You won't typically see a seawall like this that is specific to one property. So let's say, for example, I have a house in Indian Rocks Beach. I'm right on the water. I decide, you know what? I want to have a seawall. So from the edge of my property to the edge of my property, I put up a seawall. It's really not effective. Seawalls are designed to cover huge distances. So normally what you have is in communities that have seawalls, it's going to be the entire street or the entire strip that's going to share a seawall. This gets kind of interesting because as a seawall deteriorates, you could be responsible for the seawall that covers your specific property but you may have to repair that seawall even if your area of the seawall hasn't fully deteriorated, okay? So it's kind of like having a roof in a townhome community. When the unit, you know, let's say there's four units in the building. When the unit at the end has a roof leak, chances are that entire building's about to get a new roof, okay? That's kind of the risk of this shared expense, shared cost, shared whatever, is that you can repair just your seawall, but the seawall is only going to be as strong as its weakest point. So just kind of understand this is part of the risk that you take on a property with a seawall, okay? When it comes to the two types of seawalls, do you guys have any, any questions? It looks like Edwin said, I've seen some made out of wood. What's the value? 
Okay. Sea walls made out of wood are largely ineffective. Okay, so they work as flood deferment to an extent, but when you stack wood on top of each other, there's always going to be these small little areas that are not going to be as effective as concrete or even really as stacking this rock up. Because what this does is as the water level climbs, these have these uh, drains in them, for lack of a better term. As the water comes in, it drains out. The rocks essentially do the same thing. As the water level comes up, it allows the water to run out and essentially create a, a bit of a barrier between the property and the water and the tide and things like that. This style, so the rip wrap, rip wrap embankment style, is more used for tides. So we know that in Tarpon Springs, they have these crazy tide shifts. So if we get a ton of rain, the tide's gonna come up an extra foot or two above a normal high tide and it could cause flooding. So they use this riprap style in, uh, embankment to help mitigate some of those tides as a result of storm surge and things like that. These concrete walls are designed more for boat traffic and things like that because they're designed to hold up against the constant recurring action of waves running up against them. Wood and water do not do great for long periods of time. So a wooden seawall, while it may have effect for a while, it is very likely that it's going to require an exorbitant amount of upkeep to be able to main to maintain effectiveness. Does that make sense? Let's see. Um, and Dennis said, riprap is mainly to prevent erosion. And that's exactly right. So that's the main point of a riprap embankment is just to help keep those areas from being washed out. All right, so we've talked about pools. We've talked about pumps. We've talked about heaters. We've talked about docks. We've talked about boat lifts. We've talked about different types of property. So let's stop for just a second and talk about when I have this property that I'm putting into the MLS, what does that really mean, okay? So the biggest takeaway is understanding the differences in the features and how to showcase them. Being the expert. In this market, in this economy, being the expert is going to set you guys up for exponentially more business. And so that's really what I want you to take, a, excuse me, take away from this. Um, Diane just asked, would the seller know if they were liable for a vertical seawall? In theory, yes, but in all practicality, depending on how these neighbors are communicating and things like that, they will fix seawall one property type at a time. So they may or they may not. I mean, if they're out on the water regularly, most people are gonna be looking at their seawall and they're gonna get an idea of what kind of condition it's in. Concrete seawalls typically have a usable life of about 20, sometimes 25 years before they need modification. So the age of the property, the age of the seawall, different things like that will all determine how close that seawall is to needing to be modified. Anytime you're dealing with concrete and water and things like that, it's expensive. It's not uncommon for people to spend fifteen to twenty thousand dollars adjusting and you know redoing their seawalls. So it is a significant expense. Um, there are instances as well where the HOA maintains the seawall. So in that case, sometimes they keep escrows for doing seawall maintenance. And if that's the case, then hopefully when the time comes for them to be able to do it, they just pay it out of their reserves and then it continues to go on. Uh, but that's a great question. Now, many agents really don't know the differences between docks, between seawalls, between waterfront, water view, things like that. And as a result, a lot of properties are misclassified or I would even go as far as, as to say undervalued in the MLS because they're not being done for they're not being marketed properly, I guess I should say. Um, 
understanding all of these things will help you be able to market your property more effectively and help you to ultimately get more listings. And Edwin, or sorry, Olive just said, we had a quote for a listing at their seawall for 13,800 for a 40 foot replacement. And that's probably about right. Um, you know, this is just one of those things, but understand once it's done, it's good for a, an extended period of time. Especially when we are a listing agent, asking these questions allow us to look like the expert. And right now, guys, when we are in an economy where we have more agents than people, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but you guys know what I mean. We have so many real estate agents right now that when you can come in and you can position yourself as that expert, one, you're more likely to get chosen, and two, you're more likely to be able to justify your commission. So they're not gonna beat you up as much about it because you guys know what you're talking about. You know the questions to ask. In your public remarks, make sure that you showcase those items. Home with 57 feet seawall. Put that in your public remarks because agents, and I've run into this in the past, agents have the ability to look for specific keywords in their property search. So use the keywords, dock, boat lift, um, seawall, all of those things. Make sure that the buyers are aware of the fact that they have them. Don't just assume that because it's in a picture, they're going to know. It doesn't work that way. Um, and Edwin said, what about boat ramps? Do they add value? Um, it depends on the type of boat ramp. So if it's a community boat ramp, then absolutely that's part of the feature of the community that's going to carry into the desirability. But in terms of an appraisal, it might be harder to quantify. So it's just a matter of understanding what you have and marketing it and leveraging it for the most amount possible. Um, use your keywords, okay? If you guys can do nothing else, use your keywords. Because ultimately, I have had a buyer that said, I have to have a dock with a boat lift. So I actually went into the public remarks section of the search for the ad edit in Stellar and added the word boat lift. That way, the only properties that were going to pop up are the ones that specifically said property with a boat lift, okay? There probably are other properties out there that had a boat lift but didn't talk about it. So make sure that you do. Be that expert. And then don't let your property get missed by a buyer because you guys didn't specify. You just go, ah, I don't really understand the waterfront features or whatever it is, so I'm just going to let the buyer figure it out. We don't want to do that. We want to be the expert that can provide those answers. All right. So this is what I have for those features. What questions do you guys have as we've moved through? Anything about pools or docks or seawalls or anything like that? What do you guys got? Was this something that you guys learned from? Was it helpful? You know, what kind of, give me some feedback here. What did you guys, what did you think? Michelle said that was awesome. I appreciate that. Very helpful. Okay, good. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that I want to be able to start doing more of for you guys because these are the kinds of things that are going to help us set up to be different in this, in this environment. You know, real estate, as we know, it is changing. So I want to be able to bring some stuff to you guys. And this is something as brokers, we've really been talking a lot about finding those types of things that are going to be valuable for you all as agents, something that's going to help you be able to find more success as we move through this. Um, so if there's something particular that you guys want to learn about, if there's something that you're like, hey, I really don't know, um, absolutely send them out to us because we want to make sure that we're providing that kind of value for you. And Cindy asked a great question. Can seawalls be inspected? Absolutely. Um, there are structural engineers out there that specifically do seawall inspections. So they can go in, they have certain tools and things like that that they can use to determine how sturdy, how stable, how much usable life left these seawalls have. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to touch on it and I completely forgot. 
yeah, absolutely. You can have those engineers come out and look at those seawalls to be able to determine kind of what kind of condition they're in, things like that. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and Olivia said, back to water frontage. What about where the water frontage amount greatly differs? How would you determine that value? So that's a really good question as well. Uh, okay, the short answer is, if you can find it on a survey, I would go off what the survey says, because that's gonna be the best determining factor that we have. In the absence of a survey, the caution I would make to you guys is, I want to be careful how I say this. Don't guess. Because if you advertise that the property has 63 feet of water frontage, and then all of a sudden the buyer has a survey and it's 18 feet of water frontage, that's going to that's gonna be different in terms of the value. So what I would say is try and get it from one of the government maps or a survey or something like that to be able to really determine how much water frontage it has and then when it comes to determining that value, it really just becomes a matter of comparing apples to apples. So trying to find other properties that have similar amounts of water frontage. Um, it's, it's not a perfect science. So there's not say, um, you know, 40 feet of seawall equals 15,000 in value in the home or whatever else. Um, Wendy said, can you say approximately? And absolutely, I would encourage you guys to use things like approximately 60 feet in water frontage or something like that. Uh, if we can get the information to quantify it, then certainly do. But if we're not 100% sure, then yes, use things like approximately. Uh, Cindy asked, can docks or lifts not show when pulling permits? It could. Um, it may be that the dock or the lift was put in either very, very recently and the permit's not there, or it was put in so long ago that the permit is just not coming up in the county search. So yes, I can also tell you that there are docks that were not properly permitted. Um, in terms of what that implication for a future buyer might be, I'm not sure. Um, then that becomes something that you wanna talk to the seller about and go, hey, you know, is this dock something that was put in since you moved in? And if so, was it permitted? If it wasn't permitted, then, you know, we'll kind of want to circle back from there. Um, Olivia said, for example, in my neighborhood, we have 100 feet of water lakefront, but a neighbor may only have 50. So there's definitely value there. Um, that would actually be a great question for an appraiser. You know, if you guys have an appraiser that you could reach out to to say, hey, you know, comparing 50 feet of seawall or 50 foot of waterfront versus 100 foot of waterfront, is there an adjustment that they would make? And the answer is I'm not sure, um, but it is a very good question to ask. Edwin said, I heard in Hudson that it's required for an engineer report for an inspection. Um, an engineer report for an inspection on a seawall or a dock, you mean? And Michelle said, or the owner put it in and didn't pull a permit, which is what it goes into. And Edwin said, for a seawall. So yeah, in most of the areas for an engineer report for that inspection, you would have to have a, an engineer come out and do it. Um, and then Diane said, do home inspectors check lifts for operation? Um, from my experience, no. The home inspectors don't mess with the lifts. So what I have typically done is I have asked the seller or the seller's agent to demonstrate the, the lift uh, to show that it was working properly. Because all the home inspectors that I've worked with, they don't specifically check the lift for operation. Um, but it is something that I would encourage. Because again, if it's a feature that you're buying the home specifically for, I want to make sure that it works. Now you might reach out to your home inspector and ask that question. Hey, this property does have a boat lift. Do you inspect the boat lift? Or you know, could we accommodate to make sure that the seller is there, that the seller could do it during the inspection process? That would certainly be an option as well and something that I would encourage you guys to do. Um, so Olivia, unfortunately, I don't have a specific answer to your question about 
you know, 100 feet versus 50 feet of, of water frontage. I don't know exactly what that value difference would be. I would expect that there would be some value there, but I just, I've never specifically asked the question to know um, what that difference would be. And then Edwin said, what about lighting on the dock? Does that add value? Absolutely. If you have electrical out at the dock, if you have water out at the dock, that definitely is going to add value to that property. Um, sometimes that value is going to be less tangible, meaning if a buyer was looking at the exact same house with the exact same dock, but yours had lighting and water and the other one did not, that's gonna cause that to be more desirable, which would in essence add innate value. Um, I, again, I don't know specifically what that value would be, meaning a dock with electric is $5,000 more than a dock without it. Um, but I will tell you that when it comes to justification of cost and in value, if you can market those things and you can advertise those things, then it will definitely help you justify maybe being a little bit higher in comparables, you know, because yours has it, maybe another one doesn't. So those are the kinds of things that are going to add value to your specific property. Um, even if we can't 100% quantify it, we could justify that to an appraiser and go, hey, listen, you know, this dock has power, this dock has water, it's covered, it's lit, it's whatever, whatever. You know, all of those things are going to create intrinsic value that I would absolutely try to manipulate to get the most money possible for that property. So those are great questions, guys. You really brought your A game today. I appreciate it. Uh, does anybody else have anything before we wrap up? Okay, well, I'll hang out for a few more minutes. If you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But otherwise, thank you all so much for being here. I mean, it looks like Wow, we had like 17, 18 people in this class. So that's awesome. Um, thank you guys for coming. I do sincerely appreciate it. And as always, we'll talk to you again soon. If there's anything we can do for you, anything you need, feel free to reach out and uh, make it a great day. Thanks again, Greg. You're welcome. Bye guys.